This is Outnumbered. I'm Andrea Tanteros, and here with us today, host of Kennedy on our sister network, Fox Business's Kennedy, also from FBN, co-host of After the Bell, Melissa Francis, National Review columnist and Fox News contributor, Kat Timp is back, and today's hashtag, one lucky guy, executive producer, the boss of Imus in the Morning. Bernard McGurk, and he is outnumbered in the afternoon. Welcome back, McGurk. Thank you, ladies, honor, and, and honor to be here. Excuse me. Uh, Merry Christmas. I mean, Merry Christmas. Are we feeling it here in New York oh, City? Yes. It's oh, like, you're uh, feeling it. Yeah. I miss in so, terms of being outnumbered. I mean, what is it like to be with us as opposed to him? Oh, he's he's much more of a pussycat than uh, <laughs> you, you, and better looking than you, you ladies. I must say. Wait, I think wow, you mean it the him. other way. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yes, it's possible. It's very, it's very, I'm, I'm confused. Yes, <laughs> All right, let's get right to the news. New questions about the red flags missed in the San Bernardino terror attack long before 14 people were killed. The former neighbor of one of the killers, Enrique Marquez, making his first court appearance last night. Now he's facing several charges, including conspiring to provide material support to terrorists. And he's accused of helping to plot other attacks years ago that were never carried out. Adam Housley is live outside the detention center in Riverside, California. Adam? Yeah, Andrea, those other attacks you talk about in 2011 and 2012 are what the terrorism charges are related to. As for the attack two weeks ago, that was basically providing weapons he was charged with, um, providing support, if you will. So it's very, very uh, interesting here uh, how people are responding. Uh, a lot of people are very upset with the fact that for about five years, Saeed Farouk uh, and, and uh, Enrique Marquez, who was charged yesterday, basically operated under the radar. Uh, they had weapons. They had plans in place. In fact, there were a number of terror plots that they had, including two that I'll mention right now. One was to attack the 91 freeway here in the Inland Empire, where they were going to throw pipe bombs on the freeway, stop traffic, and then basically one would shoot from the hillside as people got out of their cars, and the other one would go car to car and shoot people. Another attack was on a school, uh, the junior college in Riverside, Riverside Community College, where they would throw the pipe bombs inside the, uh, the cafeteria, and as students ran out, they would pick them off. Uh, using these weapons that were purchased by Marquez. Marquez purposely purchased those weapons because he knew that Farouk, at least they thought that Farouk may not get the weapons because of his Middle Eastern look, according to the 37-page affidavit. There's a lot of stuff in here, including a 911 call after the attack when Marquez called the, uh, the 911 operators and basically said that his neighbor was the one that committed these crimes. Also in here, about how for 10 straight days, as part of our reporting we've been talking about, the reason why they hadn't brought him in so far was because he was talking. Well, now we know for sure that this was the case because for 10 straight days, he spoke to investigators, and it, during those times, each day he waived his Miranda rights. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here, but noticeably absent are as much information about Tashveen Malik, the wife here, uh, and obviously her international connections to this. Uh, that's not really in here very much. And there isn't as much about the attack two weeks ago as, of course, we would like, primarily because this focuses on Enrique Marquez. Andrea? Well, Adam, I think you answered a lot of people were wondering why it took so long for the FBI to finally prosecute him, even though he was cooperating. But it seems like there were a lot of signs there. He was radicalized by the couple. Adam, what sticks out to you as the biggest sign that was missed and why? Well, I think what really frustrates a lot of people, and I can tell you investigators and others who are watching this case very closely, is, is are these guys operated online? Um, they're you know, on Facebook. Uh, at one point, Farouk on Facebook, or sorry, uh, uh, and Marquez on Facebook said they might be arrested for terrorism and having a sham marriage, uh, which is one of the charges also, a sham marriage, uh, basically. Um, but it's really interesting and I think disturbing that these five, these, for these five years, these guys could plan these things. They could be going, you know, looking at the, uh, the magazines online provided by Al Qaeda, for example. Um, but also disturbing to me, and it still hasn't been laid out, is how did they connect with the wife? Um, you might remember Tashveen Malik was radicalized before she came here, was trained before she came here. Investigators have told me she came here to kill. So where did that come from? There wasn't a dating site where these, came, where these people came in contact with each other. There was some other reason, and that's not obviously listed in here because it's not part of the Marquez case, but a lot of people want to know what's, what's in that. And I think that's probably the most disturbing thing is what's not in this 37-page affidavit. Andrea? All right, Adam, thank you. <clears throat> and in the meantime, Bernie, what do you make of all this? Well, uh, it, the question is, was it an intelligence failure? And uh, that's obvious. It's like asking after a building collapse, was there an engineering failure? Of course. He mentioned Inspire magazine, this genius here and the other dummy that got uh, shot up 
uh, after the San Bernardino attacks, they're online looking at this Inspire magazine. Mm -hmm. Why can't we ban that? Why can't it, is in this some way that uh, Silicon Valley can stop these magazines, or stop that magazine in particular? Isn't there some way to stop uh, Twitter, the Twitter sphere, uh, from emanating from Syria, Pakistan, places like that? Isn't there something we can do? Uh, you know, in, in, from Silicon Valley working with the government and our intel community to prevent this kind of communication and inspiration or, and, and whatever it is, radicalization. I think there is, and there's just not yeah. an, a willingness to do so. Yeah, there is something that yeah. the government can do, Melissa. I mean, you see the way that they go after intellectual property. I mean, I've tried to post concert videos before online on Twitter and Facebook. I get a note right away and they're taken down. The same thing happens with child pornography. You can't post these things because they're on top of it. So if yeah. the White House wanted, they could use the DOJ to work with these squishy liberals in Silicon Valley and say to Zuckerberg, hey, get with the program right. or you're going to face some charges. Or at least, I mean, I don't know about preventing <clears throat> communication and that sort of thing. We go down the slippery slope of, I mean, you think about China and how you can't inter can't access the internet, but there's definitely something to the idea of why can't we tell who's going online to look at Inspire? I mean, at the very least, if that data was collected, we know the government is fantastic at collecting data. Couldn't they compare that over time using an algorithm to people that are doing a number of common things? Like fl bells would go off and you could write an algorithm for this if people were going going and looking at Inspire, and then they were also using keywords on Facebook and whatever else, and they were also doing this. I mean, there's a number of common things that people that are acting out are doing, and it does seem like there would be a way to go out there and have bells go off and go, hey, listen, there's a person in San Bernardino who's doing like seven of the ten things that make us nervous. Somebody should stop by and lift up the garage door and see if there's anything in there. There's no question, Kennedy. My Blue Oyster Cult video never made it online for no. more than ten minutes because they took it down. Why can't they do the same with terrorist chatter or propaganda or jihadist videos? I mean, that's a lot of people are asking because it obviously points to an intelligence failure. You know, we have this uh, these mass bulk collection programs, and regardless of how they've been modified in uh, the very recent past, they were in full effect when uh, when Farouk and Marquez yeah. were having their bromance in Riverside. Mm -hmm. You know, they met in 2005. Uh, Marquez converted in 2007, and then they were planning these very very elaborate attacks. The one on the 91 freeway, a very busy freeway in Southern California into the Inland Empire that Housley was talking about. You know, they were going to throw pipe bombs and they were going to take out law enforcement. I mean, that was their plan. So obviously they left enough. And, and I think the problem is the reliance on the digital footprint and the metadata. It actually makes intelligence collecting a little bit lazy and you yeah. end up going after the wrong thing. Right. Not only that, though, Kat, I think the human intelligence piece of this also failed. And it's a little scary. I mean, you look at the pictures of this guy he looks like a total dope like a real goofball yeah. like with a weird <laughs> yeah, hat a genius, yeah. Yeah. look at him i mean he looks like a total dope like the honey i shrunk the kids thing <laughs> yeah, exactly the dad yeah. a younger yeah. version of the dad Brannis. but he's very dangerous i mean this is how they got their weapons he was radicalized which is scary that they could radicalize the neighbor and no one seemed to notice this in five years doesn't he Wait. have friends or family that said it's a little weird he's posting these videos five years like you said 10 minutes your video didn't make it 10 minutes and looks like you said there's all these things that happen and that's over a process you don't just suddenly get involved in a terrorist attack you become a little radicalized you become more radicalized start buying weapons within five years we have this huge counterterrorism force what are they doing mm -hmm. what are they doing this, if they're not by, finding by these way, no less a figure than since California Senator Feinstein went up to Silicon Valley to ask them for help on this they rejected her Tim Cook and that's company actually not true. they didn't that want to they just shield so she, many I mean you should, you should she's look at the history she, of the refilled, unless she's lying. Of the filled request unless she's lying by tech it is companies with law enforcement. Unless she's lying, it is true. She the said only that. way to do it is for Attorney General Lynch to stand up at a podium and say, I will prosecute any of these companies using Supreme Court precedent of Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. If you harbor terrorists, allow them to communicate, you will be prosecuted, period. And I guarantee you, they'd spring into action. All right, meantime, a live look at the White House, where President Obama is getting set to hold his traditional year-end news conference before heading to San Bernardino, California to meet privately with the family members of those killed in the recent terror attack. And then it's on to Hawaii for the annual family vacation. The California trip comes on the heels of a flurry of public events this week aimed at defending his response to terrorism and reassuring the American public. In the meantime, there are multiple reports that Mr. Obama recently told a group of news columnists and bloggers 
that he realizes that he was slow to respond to public fears after terror attacks in Paris and California, acknowledging that his low-key approach led Americans to worry that he wasn't doing enough to keep the country safe. Kat, what do you think about this? I mean, for the president to concede that he actually knows that he's moving at a glacial pace on really serious issues. Well, the thing is, by doing that, he was moving even slower. He goes on this little speech spree saying, don't judge me, you know, love me, don't judge me, I, I really do care about terrorism. Go to San Bernardino. Don't try to insist people that you care. Go there and be there. This isn't about you. But he was so much more concerned about his reputation, making sure people didn't hate him, than actually doing something for the people that were most affected by it. Yeah, you know that they move slow. I mean, Melissa, we yeah. saw with the BP oil spill. We we saw one Christmas with the Times Square bomber when he was yeah. out in Hawaii again, surfing and doing all that stuff. He didn't respond for days to a terror attack. And he, you know, the worst part about this is he concedes that he knows that he's not doing what the American people want. I mean, that's the weirdest part. And, and we're getting this information because he did this off the record on background, which apparently is not off the record background interview with some influential columnists in the White House. And he admitted these things. The scariest thing I thought he said in this meeting where he's trying to spin things in his favor and kind of like reset, no, I care, I care, I care, I swear. <laughs> he says he told the columnists that he envisioned sending significant ground forces to the Middle East only in the case of a catastrophic terrorist attack that disrupted the normal functioning of the United States. He's only going to send people if something is so huge here like 9-11. He's basically inviting them to do it. Mm -hmm. He's saying that I'm completely reactionary. I'm only on the defense. I'm mm -hmm. never going to be on the offense. I'm not going to do anything until our body count is humongous. That's really scary. That's not the guy I want in charge. And Kennedy, why doesn't he change it? I mean, when he wants to spring into action, yeah. if it's an issue like up in Cambridge with the beer summit, if it's an issue in Chicago, if it's a, if it's a shooting, yeah. we've seen him spring into That's action. That's absolutely right. And I think uh, it's interesting because the left is is still posturing themselves to, to treat this as a gun control issue. <laughs> and it's a terrorist attack. I mean, this is an act of terrorism. And obviously, you know, people are shaken to the core in the, uh, in the surrounding communities. But think about those family members. Oh. This isn't just a mass shooting where he gets to come out and wag his finger and condemn uh, everyone for, uh, you know, holding mm -hmm. the Second Amendment somewhat sacred. And it, it, this is very different. And I, I still I think a lot of it is preserving his legacy. I think a lot of it is you know, he doesn't want to acknowledge on a, a grand scale that this is, in fact, a terrorist attack. This is, in fact, an intelligence failure that happened on his watch. You know, Bernie, whatever fantasy land he lives in, the reality is terrorist attacks are happening on his watch and people are scared. And he chose to come out in the Oval Office two weeks ago and talk about attacking the First and the Second Amendment. Right. He doesn't get a do-over on that. Well, he's trying to get a do-over, and there's no doubt about it that the administration was totally blindsided by the rise of ISIS. And after the Paris attack, he said that the uh, the climate change conference in Paris will be a strong rebuke to the oh. terrorists. That's what he said. And then a week later, we had San Bernardino. Now, the worst thing he does, he actually conflates justified uh, fear and anxiety, uh, genuine uh, fear and anxiety, he conflates it with Islamophobia, and that's the most scurrilous and dangerous thing that he does. And, and he doesn't address it. He should go out today and tell people, if you see something, say something. Don't worry about, you know. But Islam then tries to fan the flames of hysteria when it comes to climate change. Right. right. You yeah, know what I'm right. saying? What, how, right. Those, those priorities <laughs> are so misplaced. Exactly right. Well, that, that's you, where his if you lies. see something, say something, unless you're bringing a clock to school like Ahmed, right. and then he will jump to the defense of Ahmed. So he, he's all over the place, actually. It's, uh, it's not, it's scary. All right. Well, Jeb Bush stepping up his attacks on Donald Trump's fitness for the presidency. So is this a good strategy? And what will it mean for Republicans in their hopes of taking back the White House in 2016? Plus, an entire school district canceling classes today over backlash from an assignment involving Islam. We've got the details. Jeb Bush continuing his strategy of attacking Donald Trump's ability to run the country just days after the two clashed at the Republican debate. A super PAC supporting Bush came out with a new ad promoting the former governor as tough enough and highlighting his conflict with Trump in that debate. And now the former Florida governor refusing to answer when asked repeatedly <laughs> if Trump would be a better president than Hillary Clinton. Would he make a better president than Hillary Clinton? Our forces, our troops 
inside the Iraqi military. I don't think Hillary Clinton is going to be elected president of the United States. She's not trustworthy, uh, and her proposals aren't much better. He, he didn't answer my question. Would he make a better president than Hillary Clinton? No, I've learned not to answer questions. That's one of the things that you do now in, in, in political discourse. You answer what, what you want to say. Wait, so, so you're just not going to answer outright? He is not qualified to be commander-in-chief of the United States of America's greatest fighting force. It's, it's hard to watch, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amusing. Kind of the, uh, yeah, I mean, like, they say, he's tough enough. I mean, is that what their new campaign what really is? What are they going to I think that's what people are really clamoring for right now. I, th I think yeah. people feel so disenfranchised. People feel like politicians, yeah. and the establishment and institutions have completely let them down. So they want someone who's... Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, Andrew, he, he's enough. like Charlie Brown. I mean, it, he's kind of like Popeye before the spinach, and he's waiting for someone to bring him his spinach, and they kind of <laughs> don't arrive, but Trump does. Where am I going wrong? Yeah, I mean, look, W's brother, I think, is in big trouble, and whenever you have enough in your campaign, oh. Slogan, oh. it's a problem. Oh, she's work. pretty oh. enough, smart enough, I guess, tough enough, but this <laughs> makes perfect <laughs> sense because it's the establishment circling the wagons. And what I don't understand is they're spending millions and millions of dollars on ads yeah. for Jeb Bush saying, I'm going to create an international coalition and we're going to defeat ISIS. Didn't his brother and his father try that international coalition trick? <gasps> and it didn't work. And so I look at this and I say, what kind of obtuse moron would spend millions of dollars on an ad that yeah. says something like this that reminds everybody of the record that he's likely trying or should try and move away from. Yeah. Bernie, I mean, when you see him in that interview and then he refuses to answer and then he says, well, the trick with all of this is that people mm. ask you questions and you just say what you want to. I'm like, wow, <sighs> that's like television 101. Are you just figuring <laughs> that out? Yeah, right. Well, obviously he's uh, he's doing the Donald Trump act because that's exactly what Trump does. He doesn't answer the question. Uh, he doesn't but, say that he's doing And look, yeah. let's just let's just qualify this by saying we like Jeb Bush. He's a nice man and it every just... It's yeah. just, it is sort of cringeworthy. Watching him at the debate was like watch when he was fighting with Trump, it was like watching, uh, you know, Mike Tyson box Woody Allen. And of course, he, he's Woody Allen. It just, uh, it just makes you, it, yeah. it, it makes you feel bad for Woody. It makes you feel bad for Jeb. It's just not his time. He'll, he'll yeah. still vote for uh, Do and endorse Donald Trump over Hillary. Right now, he's smarting after that, th those yeah. exchanges. Uh, Chris Steyerwald said earlier today that, that Bush has got to you know, start living out loud, and that's what he's doing here is he's oh, kind of no. living out loud. Which <laughs> I, was, I hate to see living in silence. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. My heart is just like. <laughs> Every time I see him speak, I just want to go give him a hug. The only thing I remember about the debate was the end when no one was there to hug him and he was walking around like pretending to smile and be okay. He just it keeps pretending to be okay and he's he's not okay. He can't yeah. be okay. And I've never felt so <laughs> bad for somebody so privileged and that's how bad it right. is. I don't know exactly. if I feel bad for him. I, I, do. Do. I do. That's I do. not that sad to make. watch, but look at his little face. Yeah. And he's running for president. I mean, you, you yeah. gotta grow a spine. You gotta have a thick well, skin. But he's you have Brown. to be a good strategist. You have to be a multifaceted player. And to Andrea's point, what is he running on? What is his platform? My dad and my brother were yeah. powerful. They they well, sat in the chair. They no. were fitted for special drapes in the Oval Office. Okay, <laughs> that's not enough. But, but but wait, I mean, on that's that not point, enough. Actually, what's that's tragic not enough. about that is he has a he had a great economic record yes. in Florida. Right. I mean, he had a tremendous economic record. That state grew. His stand on taxes. He vetoed spending. I mean, he did a lot of great things in Florida, and that's been completely lost because he can't stand up and be forceful. But I mean, unfortunately, I think he does have a lot of good policies. You're right on foreign policy, which has become the dominant thing, unless you're demented. That's your number one <laughs> thing right. on the list that's right now. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he did have good standing coming into this. And he's defending, he was defending his brother's foreign policy, which yeah. has been totally discredited, and that's where, that's where he falters. Yeah, he yes, and Lindsey Graham, but he never, he Lindsay, never yeah. had okay. a message that anyone could coalesce around. He yes. really just just went on, and he should have ran on his great record in Florida, but he just went on his brother, and he couldn't even hammer that message out. And now he's just dubby his brother. Yeah. The White House's goal of closing Guantanamo Bay, getting closer to reality, announcing dozens of detainees are safe to be transferred elsewhere. But how safe is it really to let these terrorists go? And the White House defending Defense Secretary Ash Carter for his use of personal email to do government business. How could this happen after Hillary's scandal?
Well, we told you about a report yesterday, the Obama administration deciding on 17 low-level detainees that soon could be transferred out of the prison at Guantanamo Bay. But listen to what White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest said when asked about that report. I don't have any announcements about any planned transfers uh, at this point, but uh, I can tell you that the current population uh, at the prison is 107, 107 detainees. Uh, there are currently 48 detainees whose case files have been carefully reviewed by national security professionals. And those professionals have determined that under the right circumstances, uh, those 48 individuals could be safely transferred. Unbelievable, Bernie. They will not take a pause. You saw two days after Paris, the White House greenlit five detainees to be yeah. transferred. They won't even slow it down and take a temporary pause from releasing the most dangerous terrorists. Actually, from what country. I understand, it was the same day as Paris, and they didn't announce it until two days later, if I'm not mistaken. But however, the same thing. They're tone deaf. It's unbelievable. You're right. There's about a 30 percent recidivism rate. But uh, aside from that, it's just not now. Not right now. Just wait a while, but put a pause on everything that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I mean, 107, uh, close down Guantanamo, bring them to the United States if it's so expensive, but don't release these people back into it. And on the heels, Kennedy, of the news just this week yeah. that one of the terror uh, terrorists that was released from Gitmo has returned to join the fight with al-Qaeda co to conduct more terrorist attacks. Yeah. And this is their this is their response. We're just going to green light 17 more. Yeah. Where where are they going? I mean, I actually agree with Bernie. I think I've said it for a long time. Guantanamo Bay is, is too expensive. You can transfer uh, some of these inmates. We've got terrorists in this country, and we've already got we've got terrorists in prisons, and obviously from San Bernardino, you know, we've got uh, terrorist individuals and probably terror cells. So move them to this country where they can be. We can keep an eye on them, and they can be in this system where we know exactly where they are, where they're going, and what they're doing, and most importantly, what they're not doing. The great irony, though, will you, be you don't you don't trust the Qataris. <laughs> so yeah. the great irony will be. If Bo Bergdahl ends up at Guantanamo Bay, oh, chew yeah. on that morsel. How about that? Yeah. Or put the, these guys in the population with some uh, some of these crazy uh, skinheads and uh, you know, just let them roam free. Cat, why aren't Republicans talking about this issue more? I mean, they seem to be spending all of their time firing at Donald Trump okay. instead of President Obama, and he seems to be getting a pass I was on this say, because they're talking about Donald Trump. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of reminds me of the whole apology tour, or excuse me, like the Love Me tour. He wants to close Guantanamo Bay before he leaves office because he said he would do that. And remember, everyone drove around with the little Obama peace sign stickers on their cars, and now it's not been like that. He hasn't done anything he said he was going to do. So that's why he doesn't want to put a pause on it. I think. I think he's so focused on his legacy and on himself. And the less he has to do, the better. Have you seen his to-do list for 2016? I mean, it is amazing. Polar bears. At the top of his to-do list, he wants to visit Cuba, which is like a vacation, I guess. And then he wants to focus on clean energy. Beyonce and, and Jay-Z went to Cuba. There I mean, you go. Very. Nowhere on that forward. list does it say do anything about ISIS. I mean, this is one of his priorities, is releasing warriors back onto the battlefield. It's like he's impervious to what's going and on And giving around $100 billion dollars to uh, emerging countries to fight climate change. It's That'll get him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the White House supporting Defense Secretary Ash Carter Carter apologizing for using a personal email account earlier this year to conduct government business. He used the private address even after the controversy over Hillary Clinton's email use erupted in March. White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest saying while Carter's email practice was a breach of administration policy, it was not a violation of the law yet. Meantime, Senate Armed Services Chairman John McCain is now requesting copies of Carter's emails to see if sensitive mm -hmm. information was compromised. McCain also releasing the statement, reading in part, quote, with all the public attention surrounding the improper use of personal email by other administration officials, it is hard to believe that Secretary Carter would exercise the same error in judgment. Uh, it's actually, Andrew, it's not that hard for me to believe because I think a lot of people are just lazy. And, you know, he's sitting there waiting for his car and he's uh, he's maybe editing some of the speeches he's going to give and he uses his personal email but laziness is one of the factors that got Hillary Clinton into this mess isn't it I, I think with Hillary it was an intentional deceit I mean she went as far as to set up a separate server from her kitchen table that was stored in a toilet in Colorado where she could conduct official national security business opening us up to potentially the largest security breach in decades yeah 
just because she didn't want to have to cooperate with FOIA laws and information request keeping. That to me is intentionally deceitful. She knew exactly what she was doing and arguably she was doing quid pro quo, Melissa, as we yeah. learned from the New York Times for the Clinton Foundation. Very different. But I yeah. do see liberals starting to speak up. You're going to hear this. Well, Ash Carter does it. Hillary Clinton does it. They all do it's it. It's not that big a deal. It's a mistake. It's not an oopsie, though. And, and here's, here's the difference that yeah. I, I think exists here. Obviously, uh, her server was unsecured. I mean, she thought that having to secure it to so a Secret Service agents outside her house meant that no North <laughs> Koreans could make it in the middle of the night with screwdrivers and pry the back of the thing open. Right. But here, I mean, he was actually using an iPhone and an iPad. Everyone's mad on the right about encryption. I would argue that his emails are safer on an iPhone than they are at his dot .mil account. Well, I mean, I Especially think... considering the hacks on the Defense Department, uh, the Chinese hacks, the hacks at OPM. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true, although I know a lot of data firms that only use BlackBerry because they feel like as antiquated as it is, it is the safest, but I digress. I think that one of the things that is different, though, if we're comparing the two situations, is that Ash Carter at least stepped up and said, here's what mm -hmm. I did, and he owned it, and he was like, I shouldn't have done this, where she d wouldn't even admit that she had done it until yeah. there was this overwhelming evidence. I mean, they just deny, 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 and at least he did own what he had done. Is he, is he yeah. owning it because there's something else coming, or do you think this is innocuous? Well, no, because it's embarrassing. It's, yeah. It really is inexcusable, given that Hillary was going through that firestorm, and, and, and in the middle of it, he's doing the same thing. I mean, as yeah, it's you embarrassing. mentioned, as yeah. the terrorists uh, are using encryption devices to communicate, I mean, this guy, with all due respect, this clown is using uh, Hotmail, for God's sakes, <clears throat> potentially classified material. As one of the candidates says, and I forget who he is, he says, we're being led by stupid people. Yeah. Right. And that's what it seems well, like. So what do we do here? I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it just says something about the culture that nobody thinks they're going to get in trouble for these kinds of things. Even as this whole Hillary investigation is going on, he's still doing it. But like you said, at least he said, there's no excuse. Rather than Hillary yeah. said, oh, look, I didn't know. It wasn't my fault. It's your fault. Why are you being so mean to me? You know, yeah. why are you being so mean to me? Is it because I'm a woman? But, you know. Well, there no. should be repercussions. <laughs> you broke the rules. No, but do you see what's happening, though? We're sitting around talking about Ash Carter's emails and his hotmail account instead of talking about Gitmo terrorists being released. It's like we're being sent down a rabbit trail yeah. by the left again. We're getting mired in emails and what was it? Was it Gmail? Was it Hotmail? Was it, what do you think he said? Was it a yoga pose? Was it not? Was it? It's a distraction. Yes, let's stay focused. Right. This is not like Hillary Clinton. This is less serious, but let's stay focused on the issues and not take the bait. All right, very good to say yeah. about that. Yeah. One okay. school district closing its doors today after an uproar over a controversial Arabic class assignment. Is it an overreaction or a symptom of heightened fears following the terror attacks in Paris and California? We will discuss it up number. So an entire Virginia school district is closed today due to backlash over a class assignment involving Islam. Students at Riverhead High School were given a geography lesson on calligraphy. Figure that one out. Uh, <laughs> where they had to copy the Islamic statement of faith, quote, the only God is Allah in Arabic. The teacher reportedly did not have the students translate the statement into English, require the students to recite, recite the statement, or say that they believed in it. They just wrote it. Some parents were not only upset about the assignment, but about the school closure as well. If there's specific threats, I get that. The community needs to know. But reading on Facebook, oh, schools are closed. We got some bad emails or calls or whatever. Well, what does it entail? You need to give details. I'll say there is no specific threat so far, but they took the step because of, a tone, because of the tone and content of recent communications. Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, overreaction. Well, they also have the students try on a hijab. So it was a little more than a calligraphy assignment. I, I mean, guess they, they were... tried on a hijab because I've thrown a scarf over my head when it's raining in New York and I've been caught flat-footed. Yes. Without my hunter boots. Should they have closed down the district? Of course they shouldn't have closed down the district. <laughs> this isn't a violent threat. People have lost their minds. I understand people are scared, but when they get into this, this type of hysteria, that's when things go so horribly wrong. You can't disrupt learning because someone does something slightly questionable. It's like, was it in bad taste? I don't know. I mean, I guess so. Was it a Christian school? I think, you know, you yeah. have to ask, is it a public school? But it wasn't 
it was an Arabic sentence. It's probably yeah. she was probably lazy and Googled no, Arabic it, sentence, it, and no, that was the first no, thing no. that came I, up I online. Think there was, there it, it was, was more, more to it than that. More yeah. than an Arabic sentence. It wasn't Arabic. It was Muslim. It was Islam, and this was not a madrasa. Yeah, but, but it's it's written it, in Arabic. It, that it was said good. the only God is Allah. You could have put that. Uh, you know, a, dro a dromedary is an, an, an Arabic camel or something. That would have been more instructive and more to the point. Uh, they're learning about that part of the uh, world. It was a world geography class. So uh, I don't know uh, what, who the teacher was, Mrs. Baghdadi or whatever the hell it was. But, uh, but to the, close the this, school district this, over that? Sure, was should, a questionable no, the, the choice, but force, to close the school They should district. not have no. closed it, but the, the whole thing was stupid. Yeah. And you know, Kat, so it reminds me of the placemats at Harvard, and I know a lot of people were talking about that yesterday, where they had the placemat to go home, and how you can have the discussion at home and telling these kids what to think or whatever. And to me, it smacks of sort of the same thing, where you have a teacher with an agenda where they're trying to say, I think that the world is turning into being Islamophobic, so I'm going to do my little part here in order to shut it down. Is there anything wrong with it? How do you feel about that if you were sending a child to that school? I feel like everyone involved in making any kind of decision in this whole story is so dumb. <laughs> I, they're just, this is insane. First of all, that assignment. That's how you really think. That assignment is insane. That's an insane thing to do. It doesn't matter what religion. Could you imagine if somebody wrote, like, Jesus is Lord, people would freak out. But, you know, you, it's, it's politically correct to make fun of Christianity and not Islam. But then to close the school yeah. over some mean Facebook messages. If I didn't come to work when I got mean messages, I would never <laughs> leave my apartment. Yeah. Come on, get it together. Everybody get it together. You're all acting really yeah. dumb. Not only that, Andrea, I mean, as a parent, I'm like, I feel like every time my kid leaves the house, somebody tries to, you know, proselytize them in some way and convince them to think something. And it's a parent job to teach them to think critically and analytically for yourself. When someone's spoon feeding you something, whether it's school or wherever, yeah. you have to evaluate it, right? Well, indoctrinate them as well. And they need to tell us what the rules are. Because as Kat mentioned, what if the teacher would say, right, Jesus is Lord and Savior? Yeah. They would be up in arms. The ACLU would be showing up at the school. There'd be protests. They would want the teacher fired. So there is this doublespeak. And they also cherry pick the parts about Islam that they want to talk about. You never hear the stories of the teachers talking about the oppression of women or female circumcision or murders by parents and brothers of women in the family. I mean, there's such oppression going on among women. So you can't have it both ways. If you're going to talk about Islam and you want to let religion into schools, which I don't think liberals do, then you got to talk about it fairly and let all religions in. If could you it, don't, don't cherry pick with something, as you said, as ridiculous as this. The assignment. phrase easily could have been homosexuality is a crime punishable by whatever. In oh, and Islam yeah, doesn't like yeah. homosexuality they could, they could either, but no one's teaching <laughs> right. that either. It's the yeah. one issue that should unite Democrats and Republicans. Republicans, the oppression of gays and liberals. You would think. I mean, of uh, women. women, women, yeah. and it doesn't. Right. It doesn't get the the liberals on. Um, it's inexplicable. Our side. Really. Okay. Reminiscent of the Kevin Bacon classic Footloose, a public high school in New Hampshire banning nearly all dances because of continued bad behavior. Do kids blowing off the rules deserve this type of punishment? Yeah, where's Kevin Bacon when you need him? <laughs> One New Hampshire high school is going footloose on its students, banning all dances except the proms because of proactive moves and citing a sexual assault case that took place at another local high school. Student leaders support the change but worry about fundraising. Some local residents not happy. They are saying it, quote, just welcomes kids to have their own <laughs> dance parties mm -hmm, with drugs and alcohol. The school dances are supposed to be a safe place for kids to go, and these things are rites of passage. Let kids go and have fun and maybe even be a little rebellious. So, Kat, what is going on in New Hampshire? This is the funniest. So I, I, I loved the quote from the principal about why he had to go this far. It reached such a critical mass. So he's talking about a critical mass of booty dancing. Like, what does that even look like? 
That sounds this awesome. Is, this, is <laughs> this is hilarious. This is hilarious. I don't. I don't know. I never had any fun at school dances. I didn't cry at all of them. Like some of them, I waited till after to cry. But you know, it was never any fun, so I wouldn't have been that upset. But but I. I it, it's absolutely true. I mean, water flows downhill, <laughs> and if if kids aren't uh, if they're not in the safe watershed in that sacred auditorium, where are they going to go? What the dens street. of sins yes. will they find the in order life. to <laughs> indulge those those urges, could Bernie? Lead, could Bernie. definitely lead them astray. I don't know. Listen, look, uh, I'm kind of torn on this uh, as a, as the father of a daughter. Uh, the, yeah, there you I, go. I, how can you have a where would a you teach, rather your daughter how, be? Homecoming in a crack house? How can you have teachers standing around watching these kids, you know, doggy dancing as they call it? I mean, wow, look, Bernie, they do? Yeah, yeah, family I, show, friends. They do? call it doggy. They do dancing. call it that. No proof, but that, no, that's what they call. That's what they. Who's they? Who? No, they don't. They, no, they don't. <laughs> I was never called. Yes, they do. No. They did. <laughs> No, you're, you're an old pervert. Hey, hey, you're you guys, a, lot of these young, a lot of these young kids, though, they're, they're little knucklehead males that are, uh, they, they take it too far. I mean, oh. you know, you got to draw Spoken the lines. Spoken like a dad. You know, I mean, Andrew, this is where it starts. It starts in high school where uh, young men are, are now persecuted and prosecuted without due process. This is not a new story. I mean, I go back to junior high dances, and I recall there was a lot of bumping and grinding or whatever you called Doggy it, and they were not leaving room <laughs> for the the Holy Spirit, that is for sure. Yeah. And I, no. I mean, this is just what kids do, and you had to have the monitors come up, and not me, of course. I was yeah. always manding uh, the punch bowl. But they were separating different people, and that's just what you do. But you're yes. right, they're going to do the yeah. horizontal hula somewhere else. Okay, and dance. you know what happens but 40 weeks after the horizontal hula? hula. <laughs> it's much worse than a doggy dance. <laughs> do you have any euphemisms you'd like to add? No, I, I mean, I would like to try and be the voice of reason for a moment here. I mean, there. this is a reaction to St. Paul's and everything that happened here and the liability and this is a, I mean this is Exeter this is a boarding school I mean they're sitting there and they're watching everything that's happening to all these different schools sweeping every campus oh excuse me it is not the Exeter it is in Exeter New Hampshire it's a public school there let me correct myself Exeter but they're watching everything that's happening on all these different campuses and they're saying you know what it is not worth the risk yeah we can't patrol what's going on we're not even gonna try it's too much trouble well that's a problem when the left and yeah. in, indulges uh, torts lawyers isn't it then everything is about a fear it's of all liability. Tainted. It's tainted and everyone worries about getting sued. Good job, President Obama. <laughs> but a woman do Santa's job. What some children have to say about that. Spoiler alert, little kids aren't very politically correct. You don't want to miss some of the responses. It's coming up next. Santa Claus right down Santa Claus Lane. Vixen and Blitzen and all his reindeer are pulling on the rain. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. Hang your stocking. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. Better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Well. The big question today, could a woman do Santa's job? Not according to some little kids. One creative agency posing a question to a group of youngsters as part of a social experiment aimed at encouraging parents to talk to their kids about gender inequality. Watch what happened. The one she would get lost in the sky. Yeah, because you have to go around the whole world. If she had the baby, then then she'd be then she'd be like doing the present, taking care of the baby, giving it milk. The baby would crush all the toys when when they're trying to bring it to other children. I think she'll get I still get a headache. My favorite one was she will get lost in the Mine sky. Too. No. Too. I, I wish that the like women don't know direction stereotype would catch on because I don't know directions at all. And I would love it for people to not tell me, you know, I'm on the southwest corner of blah, 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 and expect me to know <laughs> what in the gosh darn heck that means because I just don't and I never will. Do you think now is going to come after these little kids, Bernie? I no, mean, no. Out, of the, out of the yes. mouths of babes. Not only will they, they should, these little uh, chauvinist bigots. <laughs> These future Republicans, but, no, the kids are obviously innocent. They uh, they say the darndest things. Look, ask them, could a skinny guy with uh, a bald head do Santa's job? And they come up with answers that say, no way. They used to fat, white-haired, white guys being Santa Claus. But they jump, they jump on the stereotype of them saying,
saying that their mom's pregnant. Guess what? Half of those little tiny kids mm -hmm. have recently watched their mom be pregnant and have a baby because they're older brothers or sisters. Like, I mean, they're saying, oh, they think women only have babies. Well, those kids, their moms recently half the time did, and they have a sibling. I mean, I don't know. It's it's really the, 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 people, the kids in Great Britain are horribly misogynistic. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Exactly These things right. are so one-sided. Uh, this agency knows exactly what they're doing. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that, you know, these mm. kids are indoctrinated into an anti-woman culture. If they see Santa, how they see Santa. Yeah. And they shouldn't be shamed for thinking that Santa's a guy. She'd have to go to the gym things. and work out. Guess what? Guys are usually stronger. No, that, I mean, they're that bigger. to me was the they're funniest bigger. comment. Yeah. When one yeah. of the kids said, well, if it's a female Santa, if she wants to make it down the chimney, she'll have to go to the gym first. <laughs> I, know. I thought that's true, and you know what? I would go down a chimney for a plate of cookies. That I will say. <laughs> but we love Santa, and and yeah, there's only sure. one Santa, and he's doing an important job, and his job security is completely intact. And Mrs. And Claus, do that. Mrs. Claus does a he's very a important job. Thank you, Bernie, as well. for joining us. We are back Monday at noon Eastern. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Happening now starts now.